I am Phil, welcome to Holy Habitus. A happy new year to you, eh? 2016. Wow, where did all the other years go? I don't know. Anyway, this year, me and some friends at church are reading this book. You may have heard of it. It's called The Bible. Uh, it's a New Living Translation, and it's a reading plan for reading the whole of the Bible in one year. And it's ingeniously named The One Year Bible. It's a great resource, and I thought this year, on and off, every now and then, I would touch upon some of the passages that we cover and explore uh, what they have to say to us about discipleship and living the Jesus life. Now, our passage for today is uh, Genesis chapter 8, and it's a tail end of the flood narrative, the story of Noah and his ark. Now, in our modern-day context, we often have a problem with this story. We say, hey... Isn't this story about an angry god in the sky who essentially throws a hissy fit because human beings aren't towing the party line and he decides to visit his wrath upon the earth and wipe out every man, woman and child under the sun? Isn't that a problem? You know, how can we square that with our belief in a good and loving God? Shouldn't we throw away passages like this? Well, no, I don't think we should throw away passages like this. And I don't think it's a problem. I want to ask the question, what if this passage, this story, isn't a problem to be solved but a solution to a problem. What if this passage is written to be a resource for God's people in terms of answering the question, how do we hold together our belief in a good and loving God with our recognition that there's a very real thing called evil in the world? That's what I believe this story is seeking to attempt to solve and tackle. Now we know that at the same time that this story was penned in Genesis, there were already floating around, forgive the pun, uh, other ancient uh, flood narratives in the ancient Mesopotamian world. The famous example is the Epic of Gilgamesh. You can go and see it in the British Museum. And it tells a story of a man called Atunapishtim, who uh, is uh, approached by a god who warns him that the other gods in the Pantheon uh, have got a little bit playful and, um, and decided to send a flood and destroy the human beings in their wrath. And, and so they send this flood. And, and this god tells Atunapishtim to build an ark to go into it, to take a load of animals with him, and uh, and so be saved. And he is saved along with all the uh, the animals. And at the end of the flood, uh, he sends out a raven uh, across the surface of the waters, like Noah did, and uh, in order to find out when dry land appears. So it's a very similar story, and uh, and it's clear that our writer in Genesis is taking this ancient story, um, but using it to say something quite different. It says, "Hey, evil doesn't come from heaven." Evil doesn't come from the caprice of the gods. No, evil comes from human beings and the heart within our chest. And what does a good and loving God do about that? So Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says that God looks down from heaven and sees that every inclination of the thoughts of human hearts are always evil all of the time. And his response to that is one of heartbrokenness. I love the New Living Translations version which says in verse 6 of chapter 6 that it broke his heart when he saw it. It broke his heart. So what does God do? Well, one obvious way is to respond with punishment or to start over by sending a flood. And that's what he does. And uh, he, he wipes the slate clean apart from saving the righteous man Noah and his family. But the interesting thing is that at the end of the story, uh, we find that the seeds of evil have been carried in the heart of Noah and his family into the new world. And so the flood, the unilateral punishment of God, doesn't actually solve the problem of evil in a lasting and a satisfying way. And at the end of their story of the flood, the writer does something very interesting. He says that God promises never to send a flood again, as long as summer and winter and seed time and harvest uh, carry on. And he does this despite the fact that nothing's changed. Chapter 8, eight verse 21, it says that every inclination of the thoughts of human hearts are still always evil all of the time. And yet God, in his forbearance, says, I won't send judgment and punishment upon the earth. Interesting, isn't it? And it's, it's coupled with this idea of God hanging his rainbow in the sky. Now, in the Hebrew, it's literally just a bow, like a bow and arrow. And if you think about it, a rainbow looks like a bow and arrow, like God's bow and arrow, that is hung up in the sky, pointing away from the earth. And it's a message of how God has suspended his judgment has decided not to visit his wrath and the righteous punishment that we deserve upon us um, until seed time and harvest and summer and winter end. In other words, the end of all things. That God has suspended his judgment and in its forbearance has created a grace space in which human beings can repent and turn back to him and respond to him and worship him as Noah does with the sacrifices he offers after the flood. 
it's an interesting story because it tells us a story of a God of, of, of steadfast love who is slow to anger and abounding in love. Not a God of wrath uh, and a God of, of instant uh, instantaneous uh, anger and punishment. And it's very similar to the story Jesus tells, uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus says uh, a farmer plants a crop, but an enemy comes and sows weeds into the crop. And the attendants of the farmer come along and say, hey, shouldn't we pull up all the weeds? And the farmer says, no, because if you pull up the weeds, you might pull up the good stuff as well. Let it all grow to its full stature so that at the harvest time we can separate out clearly the good from the evil. And the good and the beautiful and the healthy and the wholesome and the holy can be separated out and treasured. This is a story about forbearance then and of a grace space. And the challenge this week is, is to think, how can we in our discipleship be people who show forbearance like God, who create a grace space, an opportunity for people to re re repent? How can we, rather than visit our anger on people, fire arrows at them, actually hang up our bow and extend to people an olive branch? creating an opportunity, an invitation to repent and to respond differently, to create together a new heavens and a new earth. That's the challenge and the invitation this week.